Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's been an interesting year to say the least with the, with the pandemic, um, but it's really heartwarming to see all the support. It's really invigorates us and, and gets us excited to continue the work that we, we do. So we had over 700 people register for this event. And so it's just, it's great. And we really, really appreciate all of your support. Um, so we'll be highlighting work that we're doing here in the B-Lab. And I wanna really just mention the B Lab is a really unique uh, institution. It's nothing quite like anything else I know about. So we're at the University of Minnesota. We're housed in the Department of Entomology. But one of the things that we do is we, of course, we focus on bees, hence the name. But we do all this really amazing things across multiple scales. So for example, we're studying things at the microscopic scale, at the level of the cell, for example, or, or viruses, tiny little things, to, think, uh, to the entire landscape. So looking at you know, square, many, many, many square miles. We do a lot of really important work on honeybees and domesticated bees, and we also focus a lot on native bees and, and conservation. So we've got a really broad swath of science. But not only do we have science, we have, a, I think, an outstanding and state-of-the-art uh, outreach and extension program as well. So we have the Bee Squad, which reaches out to a lot of you, and that's how you know a lot of the Bee Lab and really does this amazing work. So we're, we're, we really do a lot of different things that are centered around, of course, uh, our pollinators, our main pollinators, the bees. And so a bunch of us are going to be speaking tonight um, and, and kind of highlighting the different work we do. And I'll start off with myself. My name is uh, Dan Carvo. I'm uh, an assistant professor in the, in the B-Lab. Our lab, which is shown here, we focus on, um, we work on, um, on native bees. And one of our main interests is in fact on native bee conservation, in particular on native bee habitat. And so one project I wanna highlight to you today is some work that's being done by Ian Lane. Ian is a PhD candidate finishing up his dissertation work. And what Ian's really interested in is how do we most effectively restore habitat for bees and for other organisms actually too, but bees are the main focus of what his, his work is. And it, what you see on this map of Minnesota is th this area that's all in yellow. And what that is, is that is area that's in agriculture. And it used to be in fact, tall grass prairie. And only about one to 2% of that tall grass prairie remains in Minnesota. And that's represented by those red Kind of red areas. So there's not a lot of this tall grass prairie left. And so a big idea is trying to understand is one of the big conservation programs is to restore those, to make new prairies, basically to recreate them. And so Ian was interested in examining restorations and really trying to understand, does it matter where these restorations are placed on the landscape? So this might be important for a land manager to prioritize where they might go. Do you choose spot A or do you choose spot B? And then and what he did for that is he looked at whether certain restorations that have lots of agriculture around them, is that bad? That might have, they might be pesticides coming in, there might not be a lot of bees there, there might be some reasons why lots of agriculture surrounding a restoration might be bad. He then also looked at what's inside the restoration and wanted to see, is it, is it the thing that's inside of it? So looking at the floral communities. So he examined the difference between the outside and compared it to what affects bees versus the inside. And what he found is that the floral community is not necessarily the outside is the most important thing that we can have in, in these restorations. And that's a really important con that's a really important finding. And the reason for that is it gives people a lot of control as to what goes in those restorations. It tells land managers and people that own these lands that what goes in your property is really, really important. Um, not that we still think there might be some important things of, of surrounding landscape where they're placed, but at least his study really kind of demonstrated the importance of what's inside. And so basically what he found is that diverse floral communities are really, really key. So highly abundant, but lots of flowers and lots of different species. So then Ian wanted to take this a little step further. And so what he asked for his kind of second piece is how similar are bee communities between restorations Okay, these are new spots created by people versus remnants. So these are things that have never been put into agriculture. And he wanted to look at and compare how these two sites differed in their uh, bee communities. 
you have to remember one of the goals of a restoration is to bring it back to some sort of remnant habitat. So a lot of land managers have this goal of kind of bringing back what's, what's kind of a native prairie. And so Ian wanted to investigate this a bit more. And he's just working on this and it's uh, uh, hopefully it'll be submitted soon for publication. And what he found is pretty interesting. When he looked at the restored habitats, the bee, there was actually more individual bees in those restored habitats. So if you went out and counted each individual, you get more bees in those restored habitats than you would in the remnants. However, there is the same number of species. So there is, you know, there's about four, about just under 500 species of bees in Minnesota. And it's the same number of bees were found in the remnants and the restorations. Uh, so if you were to count up the number of kinds, it was roughly equal. But what was interesting is that there were different, different uh, communities of bees, different types of bees in the restorations than in the remnants. And in particular, what he found is that in those remnant prairies, there are a bunch of bees that are specialized that are found in those prairies. So there's more of these specialist bees. And what I mean by specialist bees is that they go and uh, go to flowers and um, uh, go to specific species of flowers. Lots of bees like honeybees and bumblebees will visit tons and tons of flowers. Some bees are fairly specific and those specific bees are really what's in the remnants. So what this tells us then is that in addition to what's inside the restorations, like I said, is really important, that specific plant species, those species that particular bees rely on, might be something to focus on as we create these restorations moving forward. So this idea of how do we most effectively create restorations and what do we put inside them, we're continuing to do more work on that. This is some uh, new work that's being done by Beth Ann uh, Berninga Sokolar, who's a postdoc, and Julia Brokaw in my lab. We're also collaborating with Eric Lonsdorf and Neil Williams um, at different institutions uh, doing this work as well. And what, what, what they're trying to figure out is how do we optimize seed mixes for pollinators? And one of the key things is that these seed mixes can be incredibly expensive. Some of them can be up to $1,000 an acre. And if you're trying to bring back entire landscapes, you know, thousands and thousands of acres, that can be cost prohibitive really quickly. And so they're trying to ask, can we create cost effective seed mixes? And so what they've done is they basically created these little tiny patches of pollinator habitat out at Rosemount uh, here uh, south of the Twin Cities. And they have, uh, each of these patches has different number of plant species, might have different numbers of seeds. And they're looking at how that affects the amount of flowers that are in these different plots. And so th that work is, 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 is ongoing and we're just getting data into it now. So I'll be excited to share that with you at the next State of the Bees. Okay, so launching onto a third project that I wanna highlight because what it does, this project really does is it, uh, to me, it encapsulates a lot of what we do in the bee lab. It incorporates a lot of different aspects. And we'll call this, we, we call this as the Minnesota Agriculture for Pollinators Project. And this is a big project funded by United States uh, Department of Agriculture. So that's the NEFA. Then we have the state of Minnesota through a couple different funds that are putting uh, money towards this. And what we're looking at is we're looking at how do we most effectively, again, create pollinator habitat. And we're really focusing in Southwest Minnesota. So we're looking at a particular area. And one of the things as we started off this project a couple of years ago was we needed to really get farmer buy-in. We needed growers that would want to participate. And because we needed to put pollinator habitat, one of the goals of this project was to put pollinator habitat onto their land. And so we sent out a, a kind of a call through Facebook and other different groups to get some interest in, um, get interest in, in uh, farmers to put, to see whether they were interested in doing this work. And what was fascinating about this is that we needed about just under 40 plots and we got about 150 landowners that really wanted to do this work. And so we just got it, this showed us right as we started the project is the amount of support and excitement for bees with, with a lot of the uh, farmer and landowner community in, in, in uh, rural Minnesota. And so what this project does is we're looking at, again, how do we most effectively create habitat? We're looking at um, plots, big plots versus small plots. We're looking at plots with a little bit of agriculture surrounding them to a lot of agriculture surrounding them. And then we're also looking at what's in those plots. So we have kind of a, a honeybee focused mix that's a lot cheaper. And we have a, a kind of a native bee focused mix that's a little bit, quite a bit more expensive. So we have these different things that we're asking. But what's unique about this project that I want to highlight to you all is that it's really bringing in lots of different things. So we're measuring lots of things in this project. And this is very unique because most people tend to do just one of these, but we're doing all of them. So what are we doing? Well, we're measuring honeybees. So we have Marla Spivak and Katie Lee, both of which are, who are speaking tonight. 
that are looking at how these habitat plots and how different landscape features influence honey production and survival metrics of honeybees. So we've got honeybees that are in here. We also have native bees. So a lot of the work we do in our lab, Dr. Elaine Evans, who's gonna be speaking later, she works on bumblebees. She's gonna be placing out uh, bumblebee colonies in these landscapes to look at bumblebee reproduction. So how many queens are being produced? How many eggs are being produced? And we're also gonna be looking at diversity and, and all the stuff of, of native bees. In addition to that, in addition, we like lots of insects. We're in the Department of Entomology after all. We have uh, Dr. Bob Cook and um, Bob studies soybean aphids and the predators that eat those soybean aphids. And one of the things we're really interested in is whether these pollinator plantings might support natural, what we call natural enemies. These are predators that eat the bad stuff. And there's some work demonstrating that some of these pollinator plantings might benefit that. So we've been sampling for predatory insects in the pollinator plantings and also in the soybean fields that lie next to these. So maybe these actually provide some other benefits to growers as well, besides just the bees. And then finally, the last thing that we're doing is we're looking at a doing a large economic analysis of this. Again, economics can be a, a constraint. It can be, it's a really important thing to consider. And so Der, uh, Eric Lonsdorf from the Institute on the Environment, he's going to be looking uh, at quantifying the benefits. So can we, what is the economic benefits? What are the biodiversity benefits? And then also what are the costs is that as well? So what is, how much does it cost? We know how much it costs to plant these. We know much how it costs to rent the land. We know how much it costs to manage it. And so we, what he's gonna be doing is trying to figure out how do we get the best return on our investment, investment based upon what our different goals are. So I'm super excited about this project. We got a little bit hung up with COVID in this last year. So we were, we're, we're a little bit delayed as is everyone, but we have a full year planned and excited about it. And I do really wanna highlight uh, Christina Heron-Sweet who has been uh, instrumental in this project. She's the project lead and is really putting all of this together and has and just done a, a fantastic job. So I, every time I talk about this, I just have to give praise to the, to the, to the work that Christina is doing. All right. Final project is one that I'm really excited about, and uh, it's this idea of I'm excited about all of them. But who are the bees of Minnesota? And and uh, before I get started, these are not the bees of Minnesota; um, they're just the collaborators. Uh, so I want to highlight Zach Portman. He's in my lab group. He's a taxonomist, and he does all of our identifications. Bees are very hard to identify. Um, I don't let anyone else in the lab do the identification except for Zach. This is Zach that's his job, full-time identifying bees. Um, Ian Lane, who I mentioned before, is on this project. Um, uh, is a grad student helping out. And then Jessica Peterson from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, who is, a, is an entomologist and ecologist who's been doing a lot of great work at DNR, who's been, who's been uh, collaborating a lot on this project. So one of the things we're trying to figure out is which species, which bees, which native bees do we have in Minnesota? And so we, are, we have now have amassed a really amazing data set. So we have about 100,000 specimen records of bees. And so these are bees on little pins that are identified and they're all throughout the state. So you have, a, these are some, these are representations of where we've got a lot of our collections. And most of these dots are uh, multiple collection, multiple specimens of bees, but we have about 100,000 records. It's really amazing, it's, it's, it's incredible. And this, thus far, we're still kind of cleaning things up, but about 470, 475 species now that we have documented in the state. So um, that's, a, that's more than we know, at least they're documented in Wisconsin and Michigan and of course, Iowa. And, uh, but I will say as we move west, we're gonna get a lot more. So I'm gonna guess North Dakota, once that's been done, we'll have a lot more species than we have here. And we're working with data that we've collected. We're working with data that uh, Jessica and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has collected. But we're also working with, a with the data from uh, the University of Minnesota uh, insect collection. This is a huge collection of insects. And they have, they have insects that date back quite far, quite far. And in fact, we have a bee, this Usura, which you see here, this kind of longhorn bee, was the first bee documented in Minnesota, and it's from 1890. And so we have these specimens and collections that have go back to now um, 100 and 130 years, right? So we're starting to really get long-term information and long-term data, and we're using that in this as well. So it's a really unique thing, and it's a lot of fun to go through this collection. It's just this massive amount of data, and we're trying to get a, just a good handle on what's really here. And that hasn't been done before, and it's a lot harder than you think. 
Um, but with that, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest in the lab and the work we do. And what I want to do next is I want to turn this over to uh, Dr. Elaine Evans. Hi, my name is Elaine Evans, and I'm excited to be here with you today talking about our native pollinator education and outreach programs. I'm gonna focus on three of the things that we work on, being aware of the importance of pollinators, sharing action steps to help pollinators and monitoring pollinators with help from the public. I'm really excited to share our pollinator education to toolkits. These um, are a mix of interactive games and activities, posters that are helping educators across Minnesota to reach more people with um, important information about what po pollinators are and how we can help them. One component that I want you guys to be aware of especially are the digital kits. So these are free and available to anyone. You just need to sign up and we're hoping that you will be inspired to share your enthusiasm for pollinators with your community and help raise awareness. This program was supported by the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. For action steps to help pollinators, we talk a lot about planting flowers, but I want to talk about three other things, not that planting flowers isn't important, but I've got information to share on these next items. First, I want to ask you guys a question. Where do most bees live? In trees, in the ground, in plant stems, or in the grass? Over 80% of bees make nests in the ground, and we can help them by providing a lot of different variety of um, habitats in the ground, so both bare and covered, as well as disturbed and undisturbed. Most of the questions we get are actually about the other 20% of bees, stem nesting bees, and we have a new pamphlet available, so look for information about this handout that's available on the Bee Lab website. We get a lot of questions about what is the best time timing to, um, to create habitat for stem nesting bees. And the basic information here is they need to be, that you need to leave those stems for those bees a little bit more than a year to give them a chance to fully develop and come out. You can get all the details in our pamphlet. I also wanted to talk to you about climate action. Climate is impacting all of us. As, and um, that includes bees. We know that we need bees and bees need a stable climate. So you can help pollinators by supporting clean energy, taking action against polluting energy forms, supporting environmental regulations, planting trees, as well as grasslands that have these deep root systems that can help grab carbon out of the atmosphere and looking at your food sources to really look for those sustainable and renewable agriculture forms to support um, stabilizing the climate. There's a couple specific things we can do for pollinators with providing flowers for them that are more climate adaptable. So especially the, the kind of early spring and late fall, getting flowers in there that can help cover those, those more variable seasons, as well as plants that have qualities like being cold tolerant and drought tolerant. More information about that is available at another handout about bumblebees and climate change. So look for that for more information there. We also are really excited to get people engaged in monitoring for pollinators. We've got a bunch of different programs. One I'm going to highlight is the Backyard Bumblebee Count. This is going to be the third year. So we'll be happening from July 23rd to August 1st. And this is like the bee Christmas bird count. So we just try to get lots of people out there taking photos of bumblebees and sharing them on iNaturalist. And this is a program that's going all across North America. Probably the most exciting thing for me this year was that we found two nests of the rusty patch bumblebee. This is an endangered species. We haven't seen nests since the late 90s. And actually all through time, there have only been five written accounts of rusty patch bumblebee nests. So lots of information to gain from these. 
Both of these nests were right in the cities. One was in Red Wing and one was in South Minneapolis and right next to people's homes. So one, um, my son August is with me there. You can see him holding the net up to the house. The, the entrance for this nest was right in the foundation. The other nest was just right next to a house by the back steps underneath some landscaping fabric. So myself and Michelle Boone, graduate student, were there collecting information. Michelle there is collecting DNA. And we also collected pollen, disease samples, as well as um, just information about, about what this nest was, how big they got. All of this information is really important for helping us create good, um, good recovery plans so that we can can really help rusty patch bumblebee populations come back from the brink of extinction, which unfortunately is where they are right now. With that, I'll pass it on to Bridget Mendel from the University of Minnesota Bee Squad. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Bridget, and I will be um, introducing the Bee Squad and our work out of the Bee Lab. Uh, might overlap with Elaine a little bit, um, but we do all overlap in our work, so that'll make sense. Okay, so the Bee Squad is the outreach arm of the Bee Lab. Um, for many years, Becky Masterman, who recently retired, mostly retired, has been collecting Bee Squad team members with quirky backgrounds like English, graphic design, earth science, things like that. And as a team, we can really accomplish anything but our specific mission is to help people help bees. Um, one, um, behind the scenes, you can see Brooke, Jenny, Jessica, EJ, and others um, helping with projects ranging from data collection, grafting queens, extracting RNA in the molecular lab, or keeping a honeybee cell line alive. Next slide. Our more outward facing work includes the incredible graphic design work that Ann Turnham use, uses to make everything um, more appealing and beautiful um, and interesting, even things like the life cycle of honeybee pests. And the photo and video work that Judy Griesedick does to highlight the amazing colorful native bees that we find in our gardens. Next slide. So as you know, as Dan said in the beginning, um, at this particular lab, there are people researching honeybees, bumblebees, and solitary bees. Many of the researchers are focused on species found in Minnesota, those close to 470 species found here. But some researchers are also studying honeybees, um, for uh, all kinds of bees further afield. Our job as the bee squad is to find ways to advocate for all of these bees and to provide the public with the most impactful actions they can take on behalf of all bees. Next slide. So from our very unique vantage point, sandwiched between the honeybee and native bee researchers, we're able to observe a few things. First observation is that all bees need essentially the same things. They need clean water, healthy, abundant food, a safe place to live, a stable climate. Any actions that we can take to, um, to, to mitigate climate change, to protect water, or to plant diverse flowers help all bees. If you're local listening in on this, on this series of talks, I suggest checking out Metro Blooms. They're a local organization here in the Twin Cities um, and you can learn more um, on their website about the, the importance of pollinator corridors, connectivity between pollinator plantings, and find out ways um, to discover ways that you can find out where um, the seeds that you plant will matter most in our cities here. Next slide. So our second observation that we have is, well, not all bees need the same things. Some of our native bee populations are endangered, such as the rusty patched bumblebee that Elaine talked about earlier. Um, this wild bee and other bees need us to plant native flowers that they love, 
They need us to host and protect their nests. Um, they need us to participate in community science projects like Bumblebee Watch. Um, they need us to wear our Rusty Patch t-shirts that uh, were designed to spread awareness by the local Minnesota artist, Sarah Nassif, and they are now um, available at our new um, B-Lab shop. Next slide, please. So to continue, all bees do not need the same things. Honeybees, um, which are managed by beekeepers and are not going extinct, um, they do not need to be saved. So what do honeybees need? Do, what, so what do honeybees need in particular? Um, they need us to support farmers in planting vastly more food for them. Things like clover, alfalfa, canola, and how can you help? Um, if you have plenty of land, you could add these flowers to your landscapes as well as those native flowers that you are planting for native bees. If you don't have land, you can get involved politically um, and advocate for policies in your state that support um, as in uh, incentivize farmers supporting bees. In our state, Pollinate Minnesota uh, is a wonderful guide for getting involved in, poll in pollinator friendly policies. Honeybees are, are managed and not wild. So another th thing that they need is active science-based management. The Bee Squad advocates community-minded mi uh, pollinator um, honeybee management through our mentoring apiary by distributing our mite monitoring kits, and through participating in and promoting bee-informed partnerships, community science project, the Sentinel Apiary Program. Um, that program is a great way for beekeepers to um, get involved in the larger um, picture of honeybee well health nationwide. Next slide, please. So if we zoom out and look at the bigger picture of global climate change, land degradation, monoculture farming, and species decline, it can be very daunting to know where to start, how to begin to make these positive changes for pollinators. The other day at lab meeting, Marla used the metaphor of a giant messy knot. The trick, Marla said, was to find your thread. Next slide, please. So some threads are get to know your local bees and then become a pollinator ambassador in your community. Plant native flowers and share seeds with your neighbors. Don't use pesticides for any kind of cosmetic reason. If you're a beekeeper, actively manage your colonies so that they stay healthy. And for everybody, always come to the bee squad if you're looking for more threads. And the next slide. So zooming back in, if we zoom in and look to all of you, to our Minnesota pollinator community, it's easy to actually become quite optimistic. We work with a lot of beekeepers who really want to support native bees, homeowners who really want to plant prairies, um, and countless individuals um, who elevate the importance of science through participating in community science or through supporting our research at the lab in various ways. Um, this is the stuff that makes us believe that as a community, we can work together on this big, complicated, interconnected knot of pollinator problems and work towards mutually beneficial solutions. And next slide, please, in which I will introduce the amazing Dr. Katie Lee, who is the Extension Educator in Apiculture. All right, uh, thank you, Bridget. Let's see, um, can you see me? Okay, um, so I'm gonna let you um, have control of the slides, Jessica. Okay, so I hold a relatively new position as the apiculture extension educator that supports stakeholders in apiculture or those that keep honeybee colonies. I'm also a postdoc in Dan's lab on a collaborative planting for pollinators project that he mentioned. In my apiculture extension role, my mission is to connect with all levels of beekeepers spanning from the backyard beekeeper with one honeybee colony to the persons that manage thousands of colonies, supporting the critical beekeeping industry that influences agriculture. My job is to support 
all beekeepers while sharing the broader mission of the Bee Lab of supporting all pollinators. All right, next slide, Jessica. In extension, the goal is to ask stakeholders about knowledge gaps, then design programming to help fill those gaps. It's all about meeting people where they are in order to best meet their needs. One of the first things I did in my position was to use a survey to ask beekeepers what they wanted or really how I could connect the educational wants of the beekeeper community with University of Minnesota resources. These are the top four categories from that survey. The top request was how to identify and manage colony problems, which is an important goal to keep all honeybees healthy. The next was to manage uh, bees for different goals. For example, how beekeepers can become more sustainable by raising their own honeybees. The third was education on better methods to control a honeybee specific parasitic mite called Varroa destructor, which injects viruses directly into the honeybees while the mites feed. And the fourth was for summaries of current practical research. This upcoming year, uh, we will plan to focus on all of these goals. All right, next slide, Jessica. We updated the Honeybee Lab's flagship course and manual called Beekeeping in Northern Climates with Marla Spivak and Gary Ruder to incorporate relevant best management practices and the biology behind those practices. The online course is 12 hours of pre-recorded presentations and demos of topics that span bee biology, the history of beekeeping and management, and a great blooper reel by Gary Ruder. There are quizzes to test material comprehension and to provide students with ample opportunities to ask questions. There are discussion forums and monthly live Q and A's. There is also information to help participants decide if beekeeping is right for them and additional resources for those who decide to focus on supporting wild pollinators instead or in addition to keeping honeybees. This new course brings instruction to beekeepers in all corners of the state. All right, next slide, Jessica. Our Bee Veterans Program provides free beekeeping education for Minnesota veterans. Bee Veterans fosters community through hands-on beekeeping training while promoting the recreational and professional um, benefits inherent in working with honeybee colonies, as well as offering a broader perspective of the importance of planting flowers and the health of all pollinators. To reach a larger number of interested veterans and provide the highest quality programming possible, we partnered with Michigan State University's Heroes to Hives program, which is the largest agricultural training program for veterans in the nation. This year, we will prov be providing online live workshops throughout the spring and summer to interested veterans and their dependents, with classes taught by Becky Masterman, Josh Muniz, and Judy Grieseldick. We will also be utilizing the expertise of veteran, bee squatter, and farmer Keith Johnson to host this old house style accessible planting uh, for pollinators videos. All right, next slide, Jessica. All right, uh, finally, in 2021, we will have a focus on forage. Dan previously talked about the Minnesota Agriculture Pollinators Project, or MAP, which I'm a postdoc on. One of the main lessons that we took from MAP that Dan talked about is how interested landowners were in planting for pollinators and in the pollinators themselves. So on the right is an image from a video from the project showing Christina Heron Sweet and Kylie Friedrich talking with two of those interested farmers. To build on the lesson of planting interest, we received funding from the University of Minnesota Agricultural Program called AGREET to develop lasting educational materials, including videos and online interactive article and infographics that describe the steps needed to put seeds in the ground and manage pollinator feed plots. We will work with beekeepers and other interested individuals like landowners to help train them on uh, how to become what we are calling pollinator pros or individuals that are capable of instructing others about how to plant for pollinators. What sets this idea apart from others like it is the emphasis on facilitating collaborations among beekeepers and other partners to increase food resources for all bees. All right, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, next slide, Jessica. 
And next up is the amazing Nelson Williams. Do you all have a visual? Yep, we do, Nelson. Okay, I, I just like can't see myself, that's all right. All right, uh, hello, so uh, it's really an honor to be presenting with all these wonderful bee researchers and scientists. Um, as Dr. Lee stated, my name is Nelson Williams. I am the North Central Honey Bee Health Field Specialist for the Bee Informed Partnerships uh, Technical Transfer Team. And this evening, I'm gonna be giving you a brief overview of the Bee Informed Partnership, uh, talk a little bit about my role on the technical transfer team, and then highlight one of our great programs for backyard and sideline beekeepers. Uh, next slide, please. So who is BIP and what do we do? Uh, we are a national collaboration of research labs and universities in agricultural science aimed at better understanding honeybee declines and overwintering losses in the United States to improve colony health. Uh, so we are that bridge between science and industry uh, with the largest repository for colony health data in the United States. Uh, we built this bridge with our technical transfer teams, um, information technology tools, and the Sentinel Apiary program, uh, which I will talk about in a few slides. Uh, but also by conducting field trials and the annual loss and management survey. Uh, the loss and management survey this past year collected responses from approximately 9.9% of the estimated 2.81 million managed honey producing colonies in the nation. And uh, we would love to increase that participation this year. So be on the lookout uh, for the survey. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, a little bit about what I do as a technical transfer team, honeybee health field specialist, it's a mouthful, uh, my title. Uh, I focus uh, my efforts on working with commercial beekeeping operations uh, based in Minnesota and North Dakota. Uh, so a, a typical day in the field would involve upwards of 40 colony inspections uh, for a single operation to monitor the queen health, uh, colony health, population, and then disease and varroa loads in these colonies. Uh, once inspected, I'm able to upload the individual colony metrics to our database and then generate a clear and concise uh, report to send to the beekeepers with my findings. Uh, the beekeepers then turn these reports around uh, to make operational management decisions based on the data. So I, I think it's a, a really helpful tool for uh, the commercial beekeeper. Next slide, please. Uh, I am one of six honeybee health field specialists uh, that comprise the technical transfer team. My region, uh, newly named the North Central Region, uh, is based out of the University of Minnesota, and I work primarily with honey producers and pollinators. So a, a typical year for me would start with a trip to California, which I just got back from. Uh, for almond pollination in February, and then three subsequent visits uh, in Minnesota and North Dakota. So I'll, I'll go out uh, to Minnesota and, well, I'll go to North Dakota. I'm already in Minnesota right now, but uh, there's a spring buildup visit in June, a, a post honey harvest trip uh, late summer in August, and then an early fall trip in September as the bees and beekeepers are preparing for uh, the winter. Uh, we also have uh, two specialists based in California out of the University of California, Davis, a, a South Central specialist based at Texas A&M, a Great Lakes specialist based out of Michigan State University, and a Northwest specialist based out of Oregon State University. So as you can see by the arrows, we, we cover a lot of ground and migrate with our beekeepers throughout the year. Uh, I certainly do not want to forget to mention our, our headquarters at the University of Maryland, uh, where we have a great team of scientists that process all of the bee samples that we take in the field uh, that require lab processing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I do want to take a moment to circle back uh, to the Sentinel Apiary Program. Uh, 
that we offer to smaller scale, so backyard and sideline uh, beekeepers. Uh, the Sentinel program is a citizen science early warning system uh, to alert beekeepers of potential problems due to increases in Varroa and or Nozema in their colonies and or their regions. Uh, we send out kits in the four, eight, and 12 colony configurations uh, for the participating beekeepers to collect monthly samples for diagnostic lab processing, as well as guidance in performing hive health inspections during the beekeeping season. Uh, what is really exciting and new this year is the Sentinel Apiary mobile app and online dashboard for viewing and downloading your data. Uh, we also provide an online community for peer exchanges and training videos for our participants. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, a lot of collaboration uh, to to make PIP work. So I, I wanted to take a moment and acknowledge and thank uh, our sponsors. Um, you can find more information about PIP, uh, the tech transfer team, and Sentinel at beinformed.org. Um, and now I have the pleasure to introduce someone who really needs no introduction, a MacArthur Fellow and McKnight Distinguished Professor in Entomology here at the University of Minnesota, and our Queen Bee at the lab, Dr. Marla Spivak. Okay, thank you, Nelson and Katie and Bridget and Elaine and Dan and, and Jessica for running the slides. Thank you and hello everybody, happy to be here. I'm gonna quickly go through this. We've had some big changes in addition to COVID. Becky Masterman stepped down as captain of the B squad and is now temp and casual, which has to be the best job description anybody can ever get in life, I would think. She still works for us part-time. Gary Ruder is officially retired and is officially having fun. He's doing a million hobbies at home and helping holding, hold down the fort here at the lab with our beekeeping. Uh, in addition to everything you just heard is Yuki Mitro and Hector Morales who are helping me with all the beekeeping and bee equipment maintenance and with the bee breeding program that we're conducting right now. Jessica, next, please. So in general, in my lab with honeybees, we study how they keep themselves healthy. And it falls under the general description or scientific term of social immunity, because if you're a social insect and you live in a very, very dense society, like honeybees or ants or termites or wasps, you know, hornets, yellow jackets, how do you prevent diseases or parasites from running through? So right now we have studied well, right now we're doing a breeding program for bees that display both hygienic behavior and propolis collection. So hygienic behavior is the ability of colonies to sniff out diseased or parasitized brood and weed it out of the nest. And propolis collection is what we're studying now and it's uh, how honeybees collect resins from some trees, which we call propolis once it's back in the nest and they use it to line their nest in interior. Next, Jessica. So what we've learned is this in brief. It took four students, Mike Simon Finstrom, Renata Borba, and Michael Wilson's got their PhDs, and Holly Wall Dahlenberg just finished her master's degree to find out that the propolis envelope, this lining of resin within a bee colony, helps bees' immune systems and their microbiome. That's what Holly's work was. So the propolis is so antimicrobial, it kills off pathogenic and opportunistic bacteria within the nest cavity so that bees' immune systems are, can be ready to work if they need to and not chronically activated. And the microbiome species can be uh, amplified. It also helps reduce disease load when bees are infected with the disease, they go out and collect more resin. They're socially medicating. And they're, most of the resin or propolis they're collecting in our area is coming from cottonwood leaf bugs. And I encourage you to go to our website. You just scroll, look in, within the tab for my lab and publications. And if you're extremely curious or maybe you ex have extreme insomnia, you can read publications. Thanks, Jessica, next. <laughs> Next slide. So 
So Maggie Shanahan, PhD student in the lab, in collaboration with Mike Simon Finstrom, who's now a researcher at USDA, we're working with Kristen Dom, Christian Dom, who used to work for the Bee Squad, or maybe he still does. Hard to keep up with the Bee Squad. He has a lumber mill and he has been milling boxes, bee boxes for us with this really rough interior with deep grooves and jagged, rough, fuzzy edges that encourages bees to deposit propolis within the interior of the box. And we're trying to understand how rough does it need to be to provide the same benefit that we found in our research. Next. Maggie also is doing research on stingless bees. So you saw our research in the lab kind of goes local and then Nelson takes it um, across the United States, but we're also crossing borders. So Maggie Shanahan is doing work on stingless bees, which are little tropical bees. There's hundreds of species of them. They're really cool bees if you ever find yourself in the tropics. Um, here in this photo, she's with my husband, Chris and I, when we were down in Chiapas, Mexico, of course, we have to go down and help them, right? Do their research. Here's Maggie's husband, Hector Morales, and here's the stingless species she's working with. And the whole nest cavity is just enclosed with resin or propolis. And they can keep these little bees in these tiny, cute little boxes. And Maggie's studying the benefits of propolis to stingless bees. Next slide, please. Another thing we're doing with propolis is trying to figure out if it's active against honeybee viruses. So this is work from Mike Goblersch, who uh, was in our lab for a very long time and is now a researcher also at USDA in Mississippi, and in collaboration with Declan Schroeder, who's at our university in the vet population medicine department, and working with a cell line that Mike developed, which are honeybee cells that we can culture in the laboratory and we can inoculate them with a honeybee virus like deformed wing virus or acute bee paralysis virus, and then um, expose them to propolis to see if the propolis, if we can get it to kill or inactivate the virus. Very exciting. Mike told me today he's just finished up another experiment and we hope to have those results very soon. Next, please. And another student, Katie Klett, who's a brand new student in the lab, is even taking us farther afield. She lives and works in Western China, and she works with a different species of bee, Apis serrana, which is not found in the United States. And this bee has a different way of keeping itself healthy. When their resources are scarce in their area, the colonies kind of clean up the house and move to a different location. They migrate. This is different than swarming when the colonies split into two, they divide. This is the whole colony moving to greener pastures. So we have some ideas on what might be the trigger for colony migration, both ecologically and physiologically in the bees. And that's what she, her PhD will be on in part. So that's exciting. Next slide, please. And then, Three other students, Ian Lane and James Wolfen and Hannah Raymer. James is now working at Metro Bloom. Um, I think Bridget mentioned them. Their work on bee lawns is pretty much complete. We now know that planting, allowing white clover to grow in your lawn or adding in self-heal, which is prunella or creeping thyme, helps many over 50 different species of bees. So this is a way that you can diversify your front yard and maintain this manicured look and help bees at the same time. Next, please. And this, we were so proud that in 2019, the Minnesota legislatures passed an initiative to subsidize some communities and homeowners to grow pollinator habitat. And I saw in the chat that people wanted to know how they could be more involved. Contact your local senators and representatives, tell them to support another round of funding for the Lawns to Legumes program. If you're interested, go to the Board of Water and Soil Resources. Just type in Google Lawns to Legume and you'll get lots of very cool information. Next, please. So that's a little quick taste of everything that we're doing in the lab. I just wanna bring it home to say, we're interested in all the bees. All the bees matter to us, all of our 
470, as Dan Silt said, native bee species are endangered species like the rusty patch bumblebee, our honeybees whose health is not that great, to the beekeepers and all the bee people that want to be beekeepers. We, we're about all of that because it supports pollination, which then in turn supports our food security. When we have pollinators, we have diverse flowers, which helps pollinator habitat, helps biological diversity, which is so critical. And having pollinator habitat in the ground helps soil, helps nourish the soil. It helps prevent soil erosion, which then in turn increases or improves water quality. And having pollinator habitat or any kind of wildlife bird habitat in the ground cover crops all of that sequesters some carbon, which is so important for climate change. Next slide. So thank you everybody that's joining us tonight. There were over 400 people and some of you are couples. So we're so happy that you all joined us. We wanna thank you to our sponsors of this event, the Minnesota Honey Producers, Roots Return Heritage Farm, Heidi's Grow House, Man Lake Beekeeping Supply, Cooks of Crocus Hill led us through this really fun cooking event last week, Twin City Seed Company, Minnesota Corn Growers, Wholesome Sweeteners, and Saranda. So you see we have, we diverse groups support us and we really are very appreciative of that. Next slide, please. And so we thank you all the way from our rusty patch bumblebee to kids in China eating honey from Apis serrana to my front yard, which is in the middle, to hopefully your front yards and farms that can look similar. So we'll stop sharing the screen now, I think, and take some questions. If everybody can put their videos back on. Wow, my hair is a mess. I've got COVID hair. <laughs> And Jessica, will you read off some questions for us? Absolutely, thank you all. That was really wonderful. We got a lot of really nice comments and questions. Um, one question that I think is really interesting um, goes back to Dan's presentation in the beginning. Dan, could you tell us why some regions or some states might have um, more bee diversity than others? <clears throat> yeah, so I mentioned that, that North Dakota is kind of going to blow us out of the water for, for bees. There's a couple reasons for that. One is that um, for diversity, so the most number of species, bees like pretty arid habitats. So in fact, some of the highest diversity in the world for bees is places like Arizona, Southern California, Israel, um, places like that. So they like that kind of arid habitat, which you're getting out in North Dakota. But then the other thing is that the, the 100th meridian runs right through North Dakota, and that is a huge change. So that is where the east and the west changes. And it's, so it's a big fauna and floral shift. And so with that shift, you just get a ton of different kind of bees turning over. So the bees, so you know, it's tall grass prairie in Fargo and North Dakota, or Fargo and Grand Forks. And then you go all the way west to Dickinson and it's like, yeah, you know, mid grass, dry prairie. And so there's just a huge amount of species diversity that's, that's there. So there, there's no good list there yet. I'd love to do work there, but, but um, yeah. Very cool. Thank you. And then Elaine, I saw that you mentioned this in the chat, but um, could you talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, what people should do if they if they think they see a rusty patch bumblebee? Yeah, um, you actually have some pretty good chances of, of finding them in some places around the, the Twin Cities especially, um, but they're out in other parts of the state too. And um, it's best if you can take a photo so that we can make sure that we believe you because <laughs> a lot of people get excited and, and see things that they think are the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, for taking pictures of bumblebees, it's um, especially for rusty patch, it's great if you can get a view kind of of the top of the bee. So we need to see things that are on the, the thorax of the bee and also on their abdomen. Um, it's also great if you can get a shot of their face kind of straight on, that, that helps us. I know these are busy moving around and it can be hard, but um, taking a bunch of photos from different angles like that can, can help. And then if you just share those photos either on iNaturalist, which I mentioned um, for the, which were used for the backyard bumblebee count. So that's available either as a website at iNaturalist.org or they have an app. Or 
Bumblebee Watch. So that is a similar kind of program collecting records, but just bumblebees. And that is, is the same thing, bum, um, bumblebeewatch.org, or they also have, have an app you can download on your phone and um, upload your photos there. And I want to mention too that um, the links that we're putting in the chat will be sent out in an email, a follow-up email, um, uh, tomorrow or later this week so that you don't have to copy everything down right now. Um, uh, Marla, this is a question for you. Um, how do you decide to plant native plants, um, you know, possibly non-native plants? How do you decide what to put when you're planting things in your yard or other pollinator areas? Well, you plant what you like and how you like it. And then hopefully bees will like what you plant. And if you, there's a lot of plant lists out there. Personally, I think people should just plant what, however, their gardens and yards, however they like it. There's not a prescription. And um, if you like short manicured, if you like wild, um, if you like small garden plots, vegetable plot, I think you you decide on your own and then you just start Googling, are these plants, you know, good for pollinators? Do bees like them? And I go to our website, we have plant lists too. And um, plant what you like and bees hopefully will come. Thank you. And others join in on that if you want to add in, Dan. No, I, I, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, plant what you like. I love planting native plants because I think they're super interesting, but there are other reasons to plant other plants for sure. And yeah, I, I totally agree with everything Marla just said, so. All right, this is probably a, a question for anybody who's a honeybee person, but I'll just direct it to Katie Lee and Nelson. Um, how do bees possibly survive cold Minnesota winters? Uh, well, uh, Dan can speak to, or Elaine can speak to native bees, but honeybees uh, live together in a big colony and they all kind of huddle together and cluster and eat their honey and they flex their muscles and they're able to keep warm all winter. And they're able to survive even our worst winters as long as they have a large enough population and are healthy enough. I checked the bees in my backyard today, all three are alive. Yay. Yes, for all the beekeepers out there, this is now that it's starting to get above freezing, you could maybe take a little peek to see if your bees are alive. Uh, Dan or Elaine, do you want to tell us how native bees overwinter? Sure. Um, so the native bees right now, typically they, they overwinter as pupae uh, and they're often in the ground right now. So they're kind of just hanging out there. Some adults, sometimes they overwinter as adults, especially the bees that emerge very early in the spring. Bumblebees, they've already mated, the queens, and they've emer they're underneath the ground too. Some bees are stuck in nests above the ground as well, and they just can handle the winter really well. One of the things that's interesting, so native bees don't make honey. Honeybees make that honey, and one of the reasons is they can survive the winter and that sort of thing. For our native bees, uh, things that even the social bees like bumblebees, they don't, their colonies all die out every year. They're kind of like annual plants and new queens start again. So they're kind of doing it, you know, each of these queens and the bumblebees are, are alone underneath the ground in a hibernaculum. And pretty soon, I'm very excited, it's not too long, you're gonna see these big queens pop up and they're gonna start flying really erratically over the ground and they're gonna be looking for a nest site. So uh, be sure to look out for those queens. We, that, that's a, it's, it's one of my favorite things about the springtime. Great. Well, so we, we've gotten to the end of our program. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to our panelists for all the great information. And um, we hope that you will check out our websites that we sent out. And like I mentioned, we will be sending out some links. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I want to say thank you to Lucy Rogers, who you can't see because she won't put on her video. But she helped us coordinate this event for you. So. Thank you very much. And do you want, do you guys want to stay on a few more minutes to answer some questions or should we just tune out? I, I can look through the chat and see if there's anything I can answer for, for a couple minutes.
Okay, I can we'll, stand for a couple minutes. we'll go into the chat and answer some questions for you for a little while. There, I saw a question um, about native bee houses, um, how to know if the bees are using them. Maybe you guys want to give us some more info on if native bee houses are good and how to know if they're working. Elaine, do you want to cover that one? Or? Or I can as well. I'm, the, the thing to look at is just whether you have bees coming in and out. And so just check and see if the bees are coming in and out in the spring or the summer. They might have some uh, caps over the top of them right now, which might be some kind of interesting wasps. But there's a lot of super interesting wasps. And we could have a whole wasp talk. I would love that at some time. But um, so there might not just be bees in there. There might be something else. But just basically when the season's out, you'll see, you'll see little bees kind of coming in and out is the best way to see if they, if they do that. And we do have on the Bee Lab website, there's a couple resources that will give you an idea of who usually uses those. So you can get more, more details on, on what those bees are like, as well as the um, Bee Atlas project, which um, did, did a lot of work with stem nesting and, and cavity nesting bees. And the, we can share the Bee Atlas website site. There's um, lots of information there about what all those um, bees and, and some of those wasps are doing. Um, Bridget, there's a question about um, where we could possibly, or where people might be able to buy um, Bee Squad honey or Bee Lab honey or the t-shirts. Is there a place that they can go to look at those things at the bookstore or is it only online? Um, I, for now, it's only online. I'm not sure what we'll do in the future post COVID, but for now you can visit um, the, the bookshop online and Jessica will share that link. Um, as well as uh, where you can buy bee squad honey in particular. Although I'll just say there's lots of local beekeepers who sell, you know, amazing local honeys as well. So if you go to any kind of um, like worker bee or specialty store, you can, you can find those. Thank you. Someone just said they wanted more information on wasps, and I just want to put a plug in. Heather Holm just released a book. She's done a couple amazing books on bees. She just did a book on wasps. I've, I've, I've got it downstairs, but it's amazing. It's beautiful and full of tons of information on wasps. So um, if you visit Pollinator Press, um, she has her, um, the, her new wasp book available there. Yeah, and I, I, I put that in the chat. I put that link in the chat and she's got amazing bee books and amazing, she does such good work. I just wanna really highlight, highlight her work, so. Marla, is research suggesting that beekeepers should rough up the inside of their boxes to promote propolis? collection? Yes, it's suggesting that, but I don't, but the question is how rough is enough and if, how rough is enough? And that's what we're going to look, that's what we're looking at. So just stay tuned on that one. Simply taking a wire brush will help a little bit for the bees to put propolis, but it may not be enough to move the needle to improve bee health. So we don't know how much is enough quite yet. We're very close. Nelson, there's a question that just came in about um, how Minnesota bees are doing um, at the almonds in California. Yeah, so I, I just got back um, from California on Friday um, and the Minnesota bees were looking all right. Um, I think it's, you know, if, if you've opened up a colony, it just, it varies from colony to colony and 
it's kind of the same thing on the uh, the commercial level where uh, colony to colony there's variation and then operation to operation there's variation. Um, so the bees were looking pretty good. We we're looking healthy. The mites were nice and low. Um, the one thing I was disappointed in was I wasn't able to see uh, the trees in full bloom this year. I was, I was too early. So um, as I was heading towards uh, the airport, I got to see them in full bloom. But uh, yeah, I, I would say the, the Minnesota bees were, were looking good. It also kind of depends on where you're wintering those bees. Um, if you're wintering them in California, if you're wintering them in buildings, um, there can be a little fluctuation uh, between how they look in almonds based on how they're wintered. So overall pretty, they look pretty good. Let's go two more questions, Jessica, and then dinner time. All right, that sounds good. Uh, let's see if we can find another one. So, let's see. Well, okay, going back to propolis, can there ever be too much propolis? Are you kidding me? No, no I'm just kidding. No, not never too much propolis. Okay. And if it's in their way, you can just scrape out a little bit and then, but encourage the bees to bring in more. And um, I see a question there about, it's not, they collect uh, the resins mostly from the genus Populus. So cottonwoods, but also balsam poplar and hybrid poplar, maybe a little bit from uh, birch, um, maybe some from horse chestnut, but mostly from the genus Populus. Cool, thank you. All right, I'm just gonna ask one like fun question. Um, what flower is everybody most excited to see blooming or what bee are you most excited to see visiting a flower once we get to spring? And you can all answer it and that'll be your last question. Elaine, go. <laughs> Well, I, I would be really excited to see Rusty Patch Bumblebee Queens this spring. I, I um, saw, I, even, uh, yeah, throughout time, I, it's, the queens have been kind of hard to find, but I did, I did see one last year and, um, and um, hope, hope in my backyard. So I hope, um, hope the colonies around here did well and I'll see some, some Rusty Patch Bumblebee Queens in my backyard again. Excellent. Okay, Dan, do you want to go next? That's such a tough question, uh, but I, but yeah, so I, there was a bee I had actually had on my slide that uh, Joel Gardner, who used to be in the lab, took, and it's a species called Macropus nuda, and it's of this of this group of bees that is really cool. It's thought to be the most like re resembles the early bees, and the females have these very long legs, and they gather all this uh, all this um, uh, stuff from Lismachia, which is yellow loose strife. And they use it to build their nests, and so they're they're kind of the specialized bee, and they're they're very very beautiful, very cool bee, and you can find them uh, if you find yellow loosestrife anywhere, and so that's the bee I'm always most excited to see, and rusty patch, but but I knew Elaine was going to say that, so I didn't. <laughs> always excited to see a rusty patch. All right, Bridget, how about you? Um, I'll be controversial and say I'm very excited to see Siberian squill. It's one of the early bloomers and all those early flowers are especially important for, for the bees in the springtime here in northern climates. Um, and the, the squill just has these beautiful bright blue carpets and the bees collect this very dark, almost navy blue pollen. It's very unique and it's always one of my favorite things to see in spring. All right, Katie? Uh, I mean, I, I like like everything. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I just, I, any, anything that makes pollen early on, it's just so lovely to see like the bees out foraging and stuff. So like early blooming trees, like willows and maples are always um, some of the things I look for first. All right, Nelson. Um, yeah, I'm going to 
go with Elaine and, and say the, the rusty patch. I think any time you get to see an endangered species in its uh, native natural environment, I think it's pretty special. So uh, that, that's what I'm keeping my fingers crossed for. Excellent. All right. And Marla, you can finish. Yeah, I like little serotina, serotina when they come out, when they emerge from the soil, little solitary bees come out in the spring. They're beautiful. And, and Katie took my willows and maples and Nelson too. So <laughs> yeah, can't wait. See you all. And thank you so much for, for joining us. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful night.